myself doing something like that, there's this breakout of laughter. <laughs> just like you did just now. <clears throat> Dear Lord, again, we come before you and we thank you for such a privilege that we have to come and look into your word to hear something from you. We're, we're living in troubling times, Father. We're living in times that are chaotic, divisive. But you've given the church hope. And we who are the church, you've given us a mandate. That if we follow Jesus, if we follow his example, if we pattern our lives after your son Jesus, we cannot go wrong. That even in a world where there is darkness and hopelessness and chaos and hatred and all kinds of other stuff, the light of Jesus shines through. And we thank you. In Jesus' precious name. We all say it. Amen. 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 <coughs> if you've been here at least a few Sundays, you know that I have been in a series that we just embarked on and it's going to take us until the first part of June to get through this series. And it has to do with, it's called the 10 Healthy Missional Markers. And what we're doing is we're going through 10 things that, that are characteristics, as it were, of, of a church that's a healthy church. It's a way that we can assess ourselves in terms of our health as a church. Missional, because we are following Christ. Healthy missional because we are following Christ's priorities in this world. And one of the things that we know that's a priority for Jesus is that we as the people of God would be the examples to a world out there that desperately needs to hear and see something different. We just don't want to just name the name of Jesus because it's a nice thing to do. We just don't want to show up in church on a Sunday morning because that's what you do because families go to church and it's, a, it's, a, it's the thing you do as a family. You've heard me say it before, I'll say it again. We just don't want to check the box of our Christian walk. What we want to do is we want to lean into what it means to be the church that God has called us to be. Not rocket science. It's simply that we are proclaiming, we're saying that we're people of the book. And as people of the book, we, this is our authority. This is our final authority in life. This is how we navigate this world. And one of the ways that we do that is we understand one piece that's very, very important to God, and that's this piece called leadership, especially when you talk about servant leadership in God's church. We want to make sure that we have a culture within this ecclesia, within this church, this body, this called out assembly, we want to make sure that we have a culture of servant leadership. What do I mean when I say servant leadership? Servant leadership. <laughs> That's what I mean. It means that we are people that understand that, that, that leaders are people that have to demonstrate by example. You know where I'm going with this. 
If we do not demonstrate by example, and one of the things, as a side note, one of the things I'm noticing over and over again as we deal with the different issues in this country and all kinds of issues that keep surfacing, one of the things that we deal with over and over is the fact that there's a lack of integrity. There's a lack of this sense that what you see is what you get. And it's almost becoming the norm now that leaders are, are, are overcome with hypocrisy. We almost, in a morbid, kind of bizarre way, expect that our leaders will not tell the truth. And that almost is becoming the new norm. We almost expect that our leaders would vie for greatness and, and, and to do whatever they can do to get to whatever position they need to do at whatever cost. We almost expect that because you're a leader. That's what leaders do. Servant leadership is more than a concept. It is a fact. Any great leader, by which I also mean an ethical leader of any group, will see herself or himself as a servant of that group and will act accordingly. Bill Clinton in his book, Bobby Clinton, I'm sorry, in his book, The Making of a Leader, gives this definition for leadership. It is the process by which a man or a woman, guided by the Holy Spirit, influences a group of God's people to accomplish God's purposes for that group. A culture of godly leadership is understood within the context of servanthood, which is countercultural. It's a countercultural notion. In other words, when you start talking about servant and you put it, put it together with leadership, it's countercultural. Because you don't think of a person being a leader and being a servant. And the reality is that that's exactly what God has called us to be and do. It doesn't make sense. But it's precisely what Jesus was teaching when he was in, in the scripture that we were talking about here in, in chapter 20 of Matthew. Uh, and you know the story. Salome, the, her sons, and they had just heard Jesus speaking in chapter 19. Sometimes before you get to a text, you have to go back a little bit to kind of get the context of that, that, that passage. And so before we get to chapter 20 in, in Matthew, of which we're talking about, let's back up to chapter 19. And when you look at chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus is saying, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you in the new world, he's given this talk to his disciples, in the new world when the Son of Man, that's the designation, that's his authority, his divine human authority as Son of Man, he refers to himself as Son of Man throughout the Bible, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's the context. Fast forward to the mother's request, Salome's request. So the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to her, to him, to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him asked something. For something. He said, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one on your right and one on your left in your kingdom. The mother just asking for, I, I, I want my sons to have some, some sense of priority. I want to ensure that they have a place in your kingdom. If I can put a word as a mom, let me put a word for my two boys. Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? Uh-oh. Uh, that cup, as we find later on in the Garden of Gethsemane, is the same cup that Jesus is praying. If it's, if it's your will, let this cup pass. That cup of suffering. The cup that's unpleasant. The cup 
that's not necessarily convenient. The cup that goes against everything that makes sense. The cup that can bring pain. You don't understand what you're asking for, but you will. We are able, and you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand or on my left is not mine to grant, but is those for whom it has been prepared for my father. To sit at the right hand of God was a place of honor. Historically, when you go back in the ancient world, that, 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 that was a place of honor bestowed to be able to sit at per, on the right side. So with those boys, what the mother is asking is, can, can my sons have some place of honor with you? I'm speaking on their behalf. Can they get some sort of priority here in terms of your kingdom? And when the ten heard it, the other disciples, they were indignant at the two brothers. Are you kidding me? I can just imagine you guys are clueless. You would dare approach Jesus with, with something so trivial? And I suspect they, they had other motives going on as well. But Jesus called them to him and said, watch this now. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and they, their great ones exercise authority over them. This is a key piece, verse 26. It shall not be so among you. Uh-oh, what Jesus has done is he's actually shifted everything. Don't follow the status quo because that's not what, what it's about. And he goes so far as that you, you see this in, in different conversations Jesus is having where he's talking to them and it's kind of like, well, we've always done it. We've always, this is, this is the way we operate. This is the way things operate. And Jesus said, well, you've heard it said, but I say. And what he's really doing is he's shifting the way that they think. It is countercultural, and it is precisely what we are called to do as Christians, as men and women of the book. We're called to be countercultural. Whatever the popular culture says that that's the way it operates, we say no. If the popular culture is saying, yeah, you go this way, we, we say, wait a minute, it's that way. And a lot of times we may be flying against everything. We may be swimming up streams in some cases because everybody else will say, well, wait a minute, we're, we're going, this is the way that everybody does it. And Jesus is saying, no, be bold. Recognize that there's something else going on here. My kingdom, my kingdom is not about position. It's not about having authority over and all this kind of stuff. My kingdom is far more than that. How do you serve like Jesus? I think you serve like Jesus as we imitate exactly what he did. What he was doing was he was trying to teach us about what, 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 what the kingdom, what the dynamics of that kingdom. And the dynamics of that kingdom is, it, it, I, I can't articulate it more much better than the way the scriptures have already articulated. If you look at Philippians chapter 2 in Philippians. And I think, I think Paul captures what this servanthood is about accurately in chapter 2 of Philippians. Starting at verse 4. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, uh-oh, count others more significant than yourselves. Countercultural, countercultural, because we are in a 
We are in a culture that wants to mean. We're in a selfie culture. It's about me. And kingdom folks are saying that, no, 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 that, that's not the way it works. In the kingdom, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus in the kingdom. Verse 4, chapter 2 of Philippians. Let each of you look not on his own interest. That's countercultural. Because in the world, you look after your own interests. I got to look out for number one. My priorities, my needs, what I want. And nothing is more egregious than when you bring that attitude into the church of God. When you're supposed to be selfless. When you're supposed to be people that understand humility. Nothing is more egregious than when you bring that self-centered, centeredness into the church of God. Here's, here's the powerful part of the scripture. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, very powerful here, did not equate, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The early church struggled with that text because people that, that followed that, that theology of, of, of the, what we call the kenosis, there were those that said there's, that the only way that can happen, the only way this, this, this can happen is God has to completely lay aside everything that's divine. Because that's how they understood that. And we know that that's not, that's heretical. We know that the God, God didn't just lay aside everything that's divine. That Jesus was indeed fully God, fully man. And in fact, the correct way to think about that, we refer to it, and it's just one of those words, the hypostatic union, meaning fully God, fully man, that, that God did not give up anything. He did not, all, all, all he did was he by choice chose to become who he was for us as an example for us. Fully God. Fully man. I think if there's a way to serve, if there is a way to serve that makes sense for us, we have to understand that first of all, we have to die to self. We have to get ourselves out of the way. When it's all about position and who I'm going to, where I'm going to sit and all of that, when, it, when that becomes the gist of it, then we have problems. If there's a takeaway that I want you to grab hold of today is simply this. Greatness in God's kingdom is through servanthood. And those who serve do so with the spirit of humility, with faith others can model. That brings in that Hebrew text. The faith that others will see. If you are a leader or a non-leader, but specifically if you are a leader, you have to get this piece. Because if you do not get this piece, your leadership is in jeopardy. Leaders that don't understand that it's about servanthood. Leaders that don't understand that it's about servant leadership. That's why anytime you get a text from me, if you are a leader in this church, usually nine times out of ten, it will say, good morning, good evening, servant leader. Why do I do that? 
Because I want you never to forget that I don't care what your role is, what your status, how much tenure you have in the church, if you own part of the church, I don't care about that. All I care about is you are a servant leader. I've been in churches where they didn't get that piece. And when you don't get that piece, it creates problems, big problems for the church. It, I've seen churches that, that pull apart over stuff that have to do with somebody wants to have it their way. And usually they're trying to exercise some sort of, well, well, I've been here forever. They don't say forever, but what they're really saying is, well, I've been around and you haven't. And some kind of way my tenure, my being around, authorizes me to be able to get it my way. And the reality is that no, uh-uh, no. 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 If you're a child of God, I'm going to hold you to that. If you're a Christian, you're telling me that this is your authority. You're under the authority of the Word of God. No! We have to get this right. And we start by recognizing that Jesus has already set us a model of what it means to be a leader. What it means to serve. Sir, son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And if we are emulating that, if we're saying that that's our model, then everything we do in the church, whether you're singing, making announcements, whatever you're doing in the church, if you, you are modeling what it means to be like Jesus. I was blessed by uh, something I witnessed in this church not too long ago, and I don't want to embarrass the individual, but I'll, I'll simply say this. When we were preparing for the baptism, there was a lot of stuff that needed to be done. A lot of stuff in preparation, and everybody was ranting and raving about how wonderful the baptism was. And I thank God that I got to be part of it. But what really moved my heart, what really resonated with me, was there were individuals that even before we got to the part of putting water in there, they were fixing stuff, they were doing stuff, getting it ready, just quietly behind the scenes. One individual even came out, washcloths in hand, bucket, comet, borax, whatever else, to scrub it out so that it would be ready. Just quietly, just slipped in, cleaned it all up, and slipped back out again. That's servant leadership. See, servant leadership doesn't need for somebody to say, call my name and mention me so that I can get the credit. Servant leadership isn't about credit. Servant leadership isn't about, I, I, I need to make, have you acknowledge me because some kind of way I, I, I get something out of this. It's not servant leadership. Servant leadership is built on integrity and humility and a willingness to say, it's about you, God. It's about serving you. It's really about serving you. We're in a culture where people always want to be more than what they are. For whatever reason, we have this propensity to try to make ourselves look better than what we really are. Right? We, we do. Some years ago, most, some, most of you probably know this, that I was in, uh, I, I came out of the corporate world, 33 years working for a company, Lockheed Martin, as project engineer type in Sunnyvale, California. You're surrounded with all these, these engineer type people and, and, and you know the guy. <laughs> and I remember to my discredit, this is one of those confessional times. I remember one time I was, I was, I was, we, we, I worked in an area where we did these tests, where we'd have to run these tests for the Navy. And, and what you don't want is you don't want anything weird to happen during a test. You always want everything to just flow so that you don't have any issues. 
And during this particular time, we had an issue. Something came up, and, and, and it was a false issue. But by the time, you, you got to make sure you validate that it's false before you run it up and tell everybody because it just you get people that come from under the rock where they were at, and they, they create issues. So I'm standing around this, in this big test area. Usually when we have an incident go down, there's like about five or six, seven engineers come out of nowhere. It, normally in this lab, it's very quiet, but you have about five, six, seven, all these folks come out, come, out of, come out of nowhere. And we're all standing around. I think I just lost my battery. No, you're on. You're on. We're standing around in this, this, this area near this equipment, and everybody is talking about what school they went to. You know, bragging rights. Well, I went to Carroll Tech. I went to Carroll Tech. I went to Carroll Caltech. I went to KISS. I went to UCLA. I went to, oh, I, I went to MIT. I went to, and they're all sitting around. And somebody turned to me and said, I'm the one that's kind of the person that's kind of directing this thing. I, I'm the facilitator of this group, getting all the people together. And somebody turned to me and said, so Ali, what school did you go to? I said, I went to Cal Poly. Oh, you went to Cal Poly? Yeah, 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 went to Cal Poly. Wow. Oh, okay. Sweet. So they went on doing their thing, and then I went back to my little office, my cubicle, and I was sitting at my desk, and the Lord said, you lied. <laughs> so I tried to go get into some report I was working on and pretend like I didn't hear that, and I heard it. You lied. You need to get it right. You need to go back and tell that person you lied. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretending, no, I'm not. It's, 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 I need a break, that's what I mean. It's been, it's been a rough day. You lied, you need to get it right. I remember a gentleman that had asked the question, John was his name. I went back down to the area, and he was the only one there. The others had gone back to their desk. And I walked up, and I said, he said, hey, Ollie. I said, yeah, hey, John. Hey, John. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know when we were having that conversation about, you know, about a couple hours ago about school and all that? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, yeah, I didn't know you went to Cal Poly. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I actually, I didn't. I went there for a brief moment, and I was getting ready to flunk out, and I lied. I didn't graduate. He said, oh, you, you never, you don't have a, no, I don't. No, I actually have a business, business management degree, and at that time, I was working on my theology stuff, so I was still doing my graduate seminary stuff. No, I don't have that. Oh, wow, Ali. Thank you. That is so honest of you. Wow, thank you. Thank you. And I went back and I was feeling this big. I was feeling that big because I know better. But because we're such a culture that wants to position itself as better than you are, kind of, we always want to present something different. And God was reminding me that servant leadership, servant leadership, it's about humility, humbleness of heart. I know I'm the only one that's ever done that line thing. <laughs> So the spirit of servant leadership, quickly on this, there's just three things that, that, that there is a spirit, there is a, there is a true servant leadership is in the spirit of selflessness, verses 22 and 23. Unless you're willing to become selfless, deny yourself, 
you cannot really understand this thing of the servant leadership. Then the second one is servant leadership that serves in the spirit of submission. There, there's a willingness to always put yourself under. And unless you're willing to do that, it just won't work. Unless you're willing to take a lower position, it does not work. And then the true servant leadership serves with the spirit of sacrifice. And that's what Jesus is getting at when he says in verse 28, even as the Son of Man to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the ultimate of servant leadership. Of a servant to make a sacrifice. I want to suggest that And there are some questions that you have that, that you can use for small groups, but I want to suggest that. And Jesus modeled the ultimate picture that comes to mind for me when Jesus modeled servant leadership is when he was getting ready to go to the cross for us. And this hit me the other day. I was thinking about it. Remember the part where Jesus is going to wash the disciples' feet. Peter, oh, oh, no, no, you're not going to wash me. Oh, no, no. He goes in the whole thing, you know. Jesus kneels down and begins to wash each of the disciples' feet. And in that group of disciples, is who? Judas Iscariot. The very one. The very one who would betray him. I thought about that. I said, what, 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 a, what a powerful picture. I probably would have said, no, get out of here. <laughs> because I already know what he's going to do. So he's like, yeah, you... Not going to happen. Get out of here. Here's the Son of Man. Washing the disciples' feet. And then he leaves a message. He says, What I've done, you do it for each other. And it spoke volumes to us. Scott, come down here, man. You don't need to speak. I don't want to be here today. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I want you to have a seat and I want you to relax. All right, then for a moment. I'm going to settle something's coming for me. Which one? I want you to know that what you're getting ready to do, make it a change in your life. Is something powerful and it spoke to me. I want you to know that you touched me. I watched you wrestle, wrestle with all kinds of stuff. You would, every time, every every time you would come to me, you would say, "The pastor, I'm not, I'm, I'm not. I've been drinking a little beer, yeah. and you tell me that you had some issues and all this kind of stuff going on, and we we would talk, and, and then you would tell me, but." I'm going to keep coming to Bible study. I'm going to keep coming to this church. I'm going to keep doing what I need to do. And I said, yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's where it starts. Don't worry about your socks dirty. Jesus knows. He knows. Put, put your feet there. Put your feet there. I want you to know that God loves you. Amen. He loves you. And he loves you and he cares for you and he wants the best for you and I want you to know that Jesus, it's not me it's not me it's the way that God does things and we have to be open to how God wants to do it he wants to love on you 
He wants to show you that it's really about him. It's not about you. God wants to do something special. Do you hear me, church? Yeah. God, God wants to do something special. There are people that will kick you to the curb that will say, you're never going to change. You'll never be different. You'll never get this right. You'll never get it right. But God, I believe that God never gives up on us. And I believe, I believe that he's showing you. He's showing you that he cares about you, Scott. He's showing you that he cares. Oh, Father, we just thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We praise you, oh God. We praise you for this brother. We thank you. We thank you for him. We thank you, God, that he's been here with us. He has a new chance. He's getting ready to start a new program and start all over again, God. But I know, God, that the enemy wants to keep him. The enemy wants to keep him bound up. But he's not going to be bound up. That he's going to be the man of God you've called him to be. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're asking that you would clean him up. Clean his heart. Give him a new start, Father. Give him a brand new start. Have him with a new walk in life, a new talk in life. Have him not depending on any kind of drugs anymore. Have him not to depend on beer anymore. Have help him, God, to be the man of God that you've called him to be. You already know his heart, God. He has a good heart. He belongs to you, Father. And we come in the name of Jesus and we claim by faith. We claim that you've got a, you've got a plan for him. Whether it's the Job Corps, whether it's Teen Challenge, I don't know, God, but you know, and you will work out your perfect will for this brother. We thank you in Jesus' name for the great things you're going to do. We don't know how you're going to do it or when you're going to do it, but we're trusting that you're able to do it exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask of thee. God, we give power. We, we, we accept the power that you already have, that you're already working with. Thank you in advance for what you're doing, which you're not only doing now, but what you're doing in the past and what you've done that you're going to do in the future. We claim it by faith. And we praise you. We worship you. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. No, we don't. Don't you see these brothers and sisters? These are words of the family. They believe in God. They believe in God from the peace of your life. Accept that, brother. Accept it, brother. Accept that he's, he's going to do a work in your life. Oh God. He's going to do a work in your life. Okay, okay, okay. Trust, trust God. Trust Him. Trust Him. Trust Him. Trust Him. Please. There's no accident. You're here. You're here because you're here because God has deemed that you would be here. I didn't know you were going to be here. I thought you were God, but the Lord spoke to me last night. The Lord said, "You need to wash His feet to show." To show him and show us what, what it's about. That it's about God. God can clean us up. He can fix us up. He can bend us in the broken places. He can heal us in the name of Jesus. But we have to believe it and accept it. Oh God. Oh God. Okay. Oh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so we're trusting. We're trusting that that God. That God. That God is going to let you get through. Okay? Okay. We're, we're believing. We're, we're in grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but Jesus, 
in our leadership, to be Jesus in everything we're doing. We're, we have to step into that place, and some of those places don't feel good. Right. Some of those places are uncomfortable. But that's where our servant heart begins. The world is looking for people that are willing to serve just like he served. It's totally countercultural. It's totally, you get all these thoughts in your head, all these things that would get, get oh, 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 I can't do that. And God is saying, oh, watch this. When you let his spirit move, let his spirit direct, great things can happen. Great things. We serve because he first served us. There's not one of us, not one of us that deserves anything. Not one person sitting here deserves anything. Not one of us can claim any special merit with God. Not one. Not one. All of us is simply by grace. It's by His grace operating in us. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works should we ever boast. Not of achievements. I don't care how many degrees you have, how many houses you own, how many horses, how many cows you own, what's your bank account, how much stock, how much land, property. It doesn't matter. You have what you have by grace. <laughs> We're in a place where the world is looking for people simply to be the church of God. We need people that will really live into this place, that just take the Bible and say, I'm just going to believe it and just live it. No, no rocket science there. Simply just to say, I just want to live this word. If you want to live, it, live this word, if you want to live as a servant, I want to pray with you. Come on down and let's pray together. If you may, may, maybe this is an area where you, you need to relook at your whole servant attitude kind of thing. Come on down. All of us can use prayer. This. Every leader, I want you to come down. If you're a leader in this church, you ought, to be, you ought to be leading the path. This is where it starts. It starts. We recognize that we bring nothing to God. We bring nothing to God. All of us are desperately in need. I'm, I'm right there. Right there. All of us want to be our, our biggest enemy. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be noticed. We don't want to be behind the scenes people. We want to be a front stage, front stage person. And yet God says, I work behind the scenes. I work in the quiet place where there is no notoriety. Where you may not get acknowledged. Where nobody will ever toot your horn or say anything. But in order to be in that place, you first say, I am a servant, just like Jesus. And that's where we're at. Servants, just like Jesus. Servants, just like Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. We confess, God, we confess that we haven't been the servants that we ought to have been. We confess that we've missed their time. We confess that there are times we've gotten caught up in our own sense of importance and worth. We confess, God, that sometimes the, world, the world's voice was louder than your voice, and so we listen to the call of the world. We confess, God, that we need to do a better job at what it means to live like you. We are disciples. We are apprentices of the Most High. Help us, God, to be true disciples that understand what it means to live. Take us deeper in Christ, guided by your Spirit. Help us to be the church. Help us. And let us start with the baby steps. Let us start first in our own homes where we serve if we're married. We serve our spouses. God, help us serve without notoriety. Help us to have the right heart 
Take away those things that get in the way, that corrupt our heart. Your word says the heart is deceitful above all. Who can know it? But you know the heart, God. Create in us a clean heart. Renew in us the right kind of spirit that we would be the people you've called us to be. Help us to be more than just Christians in name. Help us to be Christians that actually do the work. We actually carry out the work of God. Whether we're in church or outside the church, help us to live this as a reality. Help us to be countercultural. Bless us now as we go forth to tell the world about this Jesus that's real. And even if we don't say anything, we'll look like it. They'll see something in us and they'll come to us and say, what must I do? What is it about you? What must I do to be saved? And then those that ask for us to give a reason for the hope, we would have an answer forthright. That the reason for the hope is the Jesus Christ that died for my sins. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church of God say amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's all stand for a closing song.